director of the Yale Sustainable Food Project, and Mark Kumpacher, the chief marketing officer of Chipotle Mexican Grill, join us, join us today. So without further ado, Mark, if you want to make the introductions, please. Absolutely. Um, welcome everybody here this afternoon. It's delightful to have you all here. I hope that you are enjoying all the burritos and such things. Um, it was a good start to my afternoon. Um, so I am thrilled to be joined here on the stage this afternoon uh, by Mark Crumpacker, uh, the Chief Marketing Officer for Chipotle. And uh, we're also uh, very happy to have had this interesting link. You might remember if you came here for the alumni panel a couple weeks back that one of the folks on stage here was Josh Brow, uh, who's a recent graduate here. And uh, he is now working on uh, supply chain issues in Chipotle. And he was the one who I think introduced us to the kind of reforms that they were doing and also, I think, shed some light on just the sheer scale and potential impact that these forms could have on the larger food system. And so our discussion today is going to really focus around the transformative potential of some of the things that Chipotle is doing with their supply chain. And at the root of that, I think, is an understanding of who Chipotle is, who the customers are, what things they want, what things they are interested in, not interested in. And that's going to be the thrust of our conversation. So I'm going to be asking Mark a couple questions. We'll be uh, chatting through some of these major issues. And then it's going to be turned over to you, the audience, uh, to uh, bring your questions to the front. And uh, then we will wrap it all up. So without further ado, uh, I wanted to say welcome. And I have been completely late on the bio because I wanted to begin by asking you a bit about how you ended up in Chipotle. Because my understanding is you didn't come from a food background. No, I, I didn't. I didn't. So uh, thanks for having me. It's good to see everybody eating Chipotle. I hope it's good, actually. That could set things off badly if it's not. But um, my background is, is, not, is not in the, in the, in the food industry and not, in, not even in, the, in, in marketing, frankly. I mean, it, it, took me, um, it took me eight years to get one fine art undergraduate degree. So not an academic overachiever like you guys are. Um, so my background is in design. I'm, a, I'm a, a creative guy and worked in, in advertising and design my whole career and had a number of agencies. And one of those agencies did work for Chipotle. Uh, we did their, um, well, I did the original identity for Chipotle 20 years ago as a friend, as a favor to, a friend, to my friend Steve who started it. Um, many, many years later, um, he came back to my agency or came to my agency and said, could you redo the identity? Or actually, I complained about it so much, the old one, that he'd let me redo it. And um, that led, one thing led to another, and I, I was hired on as the, uh, as the chief marketing officer of Chipotle about four years ago. Excellent. Now, I think a lot of us know that there's a new Chipotle in New Haven, just opened up recently. There's rumors of another one opening up in Hamden. And this kind of uh, very expansive growth, I think, is something which has characterized uh, Chipotle. What scale are we at now? Uh, like, do you know, for example, about how many people are eating at Chipotle across the country today and how much they might be spending at Chipotle in uh, this coming year? Yeah, so, so Chipotle has about, and I don't know, but it's between 1,300 and 1,400 restaurants. There's a new one every day or every other day somewhere, so it's a little bit hard to keep track. So it's very, very fast growing. There's a, there'll be about 800,000 customers at Chipotle today. And, uh, we think that's about 30 or 40 million customers, sort of regular customers in the country. So only scratching the surface, I guess, if you look at it compared to the big guys like McDonald's or something. But um, it's about a, you know, last year, I think our revenue was about $2.8 billion. So it is a definitely a big, fast growing company. So that's going to have a tremendous impact on the whole supply chain uh, at that scale. And so I actually wanted to ask you a few questions about sourcing before I get back to the people who are Chipotle. Um, one of the themes that we've really been focusing on here is this idea of scaling sustainability, taking some of these small-scale innovations that have been very effective and high impact and asking, how can we actually bring them to the mainstream? How can we make them big? Now, you've done some very interesting uh, innovations in your supply chain. Do you have one in particular where you know that Chipotle's scale was able to make a big change in farming practice that you could share with us? Yeah, well, I think the best example probably is the thing that we sell the least of frankly, is, is pork. And um, I don't know if that's any of what we're serving today, but if you go to Chipotle and have the carnitas, you're going to be eating naturally raised pork 
And uh, that, that is actually the thing that started Steve on this journey of what we call food with integrity because when he had had uh, several restaurants, um, he, some of you may know the story, but he actually got, became curious about where his pork was coming from and visited a, uh, a conventional pork uh, factory and, and was so upset by the, the suffering of the animals and the environmental degradation that he saw there that he had an epiphany and decided at that point that he wasn't going to um, allow his success to be based on that type of exploitation. And from that point on said, I don't want to buy that kind of pork. What are the options? And he started, he learned uh, about Nyman Ranch uh, from a guy named uh, Paul Willis, who's the CEO of Nyman Ranch, and Bill Nyman, who's the founder of it. And um, he, he learned that there's a better way to raise pork. And, and from that moment on, we started trying to buy as much pork as we could, and eventually it became all of our pork. And then it went from there into all these other ingredients. But, but the nice thing about pork is that um, we, we buy relatively little of it compared to chicken, for example. Um, so there's a, enough supply for Chipotle. Um, but that's only because farmers are added into the network as our demand grows. The way we calculate it, for about every two restaurants we open, um, um, there's a new uh, farmer that can join a, the, the network of these, the, like Nyman Ranch uh, farmers. So when we started, I don't, I'm going to get in trouble because I don't remember the exact numbers, but um, there were only a handful, 30 or 40 farmers in the Nyman Ranch network. Um, now there's several hundred. And, and while Chipotle doesn't buy the whole pig, um, we're largely responsible for that growth for these farmers coming in. And we, you know, we pay a premium for this, for this product um, at Chipotle. Our, our food costs are substantially higher than other fast food brands. Um, we spend about 32 to 33% um, of sales on our ingredients where the industry average is going to be in the high 20s and for junk food in the, in the mid to low 20s. So Nyman Ranch is one of those clear success stories where uh, your position in the marketplace has really enabled a lot of farmers to adopt a higher standard of practice. Are there any areas that have just been a big challenge, ones where you would like to see a higher standard of practice, but there's some barrier out there which is just preventing the farmers from adopting it? Yeah, everything else, I mean, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, but, but you know, the, the things that we tend to look at a lot, I think, because, um, because there's so many issues related to them are the way animals are raised. So when we look at our proteins, you know, the other things that we buy, of course, are beef and chicken. And, um, yeah, we don't like the, either of those, frankly. You know, the, our, our vision, our long-term vision at Chipotle is, is to have all of our proteins come from animals that are raised on pastures, and that includes the, the meats, but also all of the dairies. And that's very, very difficult to do in this country. Our system is not set up to support that. And um, so I, I guess the thing that we're least happy with, I would say, is, is our chicken. Um, and, and we buy the very best chicken that you can really get at scale in this country, which is chicken raised without the use of antibiotics and, you know, and fed an all-vegetarian diet. But, but that's really not good enough because those chickens are, even those chickens are suffering. I mean, if you've ever been, seen how any of these are raised, um, it's, it's not a great story. I'm sorry if you're eating chicken. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, the problem is that the, the suffering's been built into the DNA of those chickens now. I mean, they're, and you guys, if, if you've seen Food Inc., and I'm guessing if you're in this room, you probably have, you know that these chickens have an obesity gene that encourages them to be hungry all the time, and they grow very, very fast, faster than their skeletal structure can, can grow, and so it's painful for the chickens, and they often can only take a couple of steps before they, before they fall down. They're not capable of living out of doors. And so, um, so yeah, we don't like we don't like that. We're doing the best we can, and we don't like it. Um, so we're you know we're on a quest to see if we can fix that now, and, and working on on a new breed of chicken that we think you know, eventually will be the Chipotle chicken. Going back back and finding heritage breeds that work better for what we're doing. But to do that at the scale of Chipotle, you know, with those eight hundred thousand customers a day, it's a lot of chicken. Yeah, and that's a large undertaking to actually find the uh, right bird for that many people. Are there any other uh, goals that you've got coming up, lower hanging fruit that you want to see as your next big step in supply chain? Yeah, innovation? I mean, we're, we're making some good progress. You know, I mean, on, I, I mentioned wanting to see a lot of our ingredients come from animals that are raised on pastures, and we're making really good strides in that regard with, with dairy. Uh, about well, all of our sour cream now, and, and overall about half of our dairy comes from cows that are, um, that graze on pastures and, 
and you guys again probably being well informed know, know this, but, but cows, uh, dairy cows are not raised on pastures in this country, contrary to what we see on the package labels for dairy products. And so um, we're, we're at about half and more so probably more. What is the number, Josh? All right, 75%. So um, <laughs> it's, that's why Josh is on the marketing team. He keeps all of our messages uh, accurate. And um, so correct me as I go off track here, Josh. But um, yeah, so about 75%. We hope to get there by the end of the year, if that's possible. Um, but you know, this is a journey for us. And so once we get there, there'll, there'll be something else, you know, because that with dairy, it started with buying dairy from cows that are not raised with the synthetic hormone RBGH, um, which got us in all sorts of trouble with the pharmaceutical companies that were manufacturing it, because we were publicly saying that we didn't want it, and they were threatening to sue us for just even saying that. Um, but you know, it's illegal in, in the EU and, and most, uh, most of the world. And so we, we set that early on that we didn't want that. And so once we got there, then we moved on to the next thing. And it's, it's just an ongoing journey. So we started some of the conversation by talking a little bit about the people who are visiting Chipotle, those 800,000 people today that might be going to a restaurant. And part of your job is knowing what it is that they want and knowing what drives them, what interests them. So I wanted to get back to the who question, maybe framed under who cares? You're doing amazing things with your supply chain management. You've, you're aspiring to a very high standard. Uh, how do your customers respond to that? Well, to varying degrees. You know, there's some, there's some folks for, who, for whom it's very, very important. And, and they will make the choice to eat at Chipotle because of those things that I've just been talking about. They're a very tiny fraction of the folks that come to Chipotle. Most, most people, um, I'll go as far as to say, don't care. Um, and then there's a bunch of folks in the middle who are, are, do care and, and um, are interested a lot in where their food comes from. But I'll, I'll tell you the, the one thing about Chipotle, which is true of any fast food restaurant or fast casual or whatever it is, is that this is the way it works. It's taste, value, convenience. Those are the things that matter, and they're always, almost always in that order. Taste trumps everything, then value, then there's got to be one close by. And these other things that we do, like food with integrity, as we call it, or, or our responsibly raised ingredients, always come after those three. Now, for a s tiny percentage of people, that ekes up, and maybe, you know, maybe it'll get closer to value, because some people uh, you know, equate that with value. You know, value can just mean how much it costs, or it can mean what I got for what I paid, too. And so it's not completely uh, as, as cut and dried as I said, but you know, basically, if you don't have um, delicious food, you're out of the game. And so I think the vast majority of our customers, 70%, um, 80%, come only really because of the way it tastes. You talked about this big middle category that uh, kind of care about what you're doing, but with reservations, and that those big three decision-making factors trump the food with integrity. But with the food with integrity, you kind of market the work that you're doing with animals, the work that you're doing with the environment. Uh, the uh, work that you're doing with farmers. Do any of those categories resonate a little bit more with that middle customer base? No, it doesn't really work like that. So we've spent a whole bunch of time and effort trying to segment our, our customers into meaningful groups so that we could figure out what works with these guys and what works with these guys. And, you know, based on demographic information or, or uh, data, you know, advertising data, MRI stuff, you know. So um, you... The problem is you can't do it, and and that's because people's values transcend these demographic categories. And there, there we found that, for example, um, you know, young kids care a lot about animals, and in particular, um, you know, as they grow older, sometimes those those change, and so it's the, these values also morph over time. And so, so our marketing's changed; it's evolved over the years. It it it's basically come down to this pretty simple premise. It's this is what this is how I say it. It's basically the for us, the more people care about where their food comes from, the more likely they are to choose a restaurant like Chipotle. And I, and I didn't say choose Chipotle. I said a restaurant like Chipotle because I don't think we're the only ones in this game. But I think the more people care about where their food comes from, the more they're likely to seek out cha uh, chains or, or companies like Chipotle. And so in order to get that to happen, we basically have marketing messages that are designed to resonate with different folks. You know, some of the stuff we talk about does have to do with the, the lives and welfare of animals. And some of it has to do with the, 
the degradation of the environment around these big industrial farms and what the alternatives are. Or it might be about rural farm communities. We talk about that sometimes. Um, a big one we talk about is, is that not all calories are, are created equal and that you know, a lot of people are interested in going to Chipotle uh, because they can customize the, the menu. If you want to avoid glutens, you can do that. If you want to be all you know, high protein and you're a weightlifter, you can do that. You know, it's, it's very highly customizable and so we often talk about that. So basically it's, it's a lot of different messages that we hope resonate with the right folks. With these messages, are you actually trying to change behavior at all? And do you have any success in changing people's behavior once you get them into the restaurant? Well, uh, you know, that's, that's, um, that's my job as marketing. You know, ultimately you're trying to, uh, trying to manipulate somebody's, somebody's behavior in, in the world of marketing and ultimately to get them to buy a burrito. We're doing it, a lot of our marketing is doing it in a very indirect way. We're trying to manipulate their thinking around higher level issues that we then hope will translate into buying a burrito. There's another part of our advertising which just basically talks directly about buying burritos. It's, you know, a billboard or a 15 second radio spot. But some of this longer form content or stuff where we have two way conversations with customers is all about changing their beliefs around um, things they care about. And it does tend to go into these categories about the animals, the environment, health, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so, to the extent you can connect with somebody on, at that level, yeah, you can change, you can change their, their behavior. I mean, we, we hear this from people, you know, uh, in our restaurants to say, you know, I didn't know you were doing X or Y or Z, but now that I do, it's changed my view on, on food in general. And, and the, the, the reason I know this is true is because the, where I hear it the most is from our employees. They, you know, we have 30... 5,000 employees, and um, I regularly hear that it has changed the way their family eats. It's changed the way their children, you know, they, they, the, the lunches they pack for their children. It changes the way their friends eat. Just learning about the stuff that we're talking about. So I, I know it's, if it's having an effect on our employees, it, it's having an effect on our customers, too. Just a question to tie it back to some of the work which is happening here in uh, this school. Uh, and is capturing, I think, some of the academic interests of the students who are coming through the program is looking for some kind of objective measurement of is something sustainable, is it not sustainable, how do you quantify the impacts on the environment? So rather, I think, than having that uh, marketing message, which is, uh, I think, hitting someone emotionally about the animal welfare, talking about a pig expressing its pigness, as Joel Salton might say, um, the quest to actually figure out in the entire life cycle of that pig uh, how many equivalent uh, CO2 emissions of greenhouse gas were emitted. Um, have you experimented at all with trying to get like a number in front of the customer, whether it be a calorie count or a carbon footprint or a food mile? Um, does this resonate at all, the idea of actually giving some objective data about the impact of the food? I mean, that, that art and marketing typically steers away from that sort of thing. And, and so we've certainly talked about it and thought about it. and, and um, you know, the, those are issues or things that we discuss. And, and the reason I, I don't think it'll ever end up in our marketing is, is this, that we've, our marketing's done a lot of different things over the years. In the, in the beginning days, it was billboards and things that just talked about how big the burritos were. Um, and then it moved into flavor. And my favorite one was a billboard that used to say, uh, usually when you roll something this good, it's illegal. You know, <laughs> and it went through that phase of being sort of, <laughs> you know, suggestive. And then, um, and then it evolved into this place where we were talking about the protocols, you know, that uh, dairy from cows that raised without RBGH or something would be the headline, or, or you don't need RBGH to spell dairy or cheese or something like that, you know, that would be the headline. And um, clever and all these, they were still sort of funny, but, but it just didn't work. You know, the more specific we got, the less effective it was. The more general we were, and, and frankly, unfortunately, if you just said, better, like ingredients are better. It kind of worked really well, which is <laughs> sad. But um, so we're, we're launching our better campaign <laughs> next week. There's, there's, um, so, you know, it's, it's tough for us because, you know, you know, I often say this in, when people ask me about the marketing challenge at, the, at Chipotle, and I say that, unfortunately uh, for us, we're trying to solve a problem that people don't know they have. And the problem that people don't know they have is that they don't know that there's a problem with the way food is raised. They don't know how heavily processed the food they're eating is. 
Um, and so it's our job, I think, uh, as well, our job amongst many others, to, to help people understand that. And so our marketing has become, it's turned into this thing, or at least part of the marketing, the stuff that isn't the billboards and the, the radio spots. The, the, the deeper, more emotional marketing has turned into this storytelling where we're trying to explain to people in an entertaining way without making them lose their appetite and not ever want to go to Chipotle again, you know, that there's, that there's something uh, going on out there that they should be a part of or know about. And so, so that's where all of our um, more storytelling marketing has gone. And so it's trying to say, okay, there's a problem. And oh, by the way, there's, you know, there's something you can do about it, which in most cases is just, you know, you can eat at Chipotle, you know, because there's got to be a marketing message in there somewhere. You know? And what tools do you actually use to figure out what your customer wants? Is it uh, focus group surveys, these kind of things? How do you get to know your customer? Well, with, you know, one thing that's somewhat unique about Chipotle or totally unique about Chipotle is that our, our menu never changes. So for those of you who've been longtime customers, um, it's the same thing it was 20 years ago. I mean, we added a salad, which was basically not, nothing. It was just cutting the lettuce differently and then saying you can put it, put it down instead of rice. So, um, so you know, um, our menu, the, the fact that our menu doesn't uh, change means that we don't really spend a lot of time, you know, out there with, we don't have a laboratory or food scientists or anybody trying to figure out what, you know, focus groups trying to figure out what people want in the next product. You know, fast food marketing um, works like this. I mean, you, you basically have a cycle across a year and you can have a whatever frequency you want. Typically it's three uh, or four product introductions every year and you layer around that marketing and you build sales to that, to, for that product and then you take that product away and you add a new one and you do that across the year. And if you're a public company, you do that at the same time every year so that you have comps, so you're not negatively comping against a, a peak from the previous year. So you get into a fixed cycle, and there's an enormous amount of marketing expense around, around that. And so, of course, they spend a ton of money trying to figure out what their customers want. So we don't do any of that. And as a result, we spend 1.75% uh, of our sales on marketing as opposed to the industry norm, which might be 3%, 4 even 5 or if you're Red Bull, 50%, apparently. Um, that's, I've actually heard that, that their sales are $4 billion and their marketing budget's $2 billion. Um, so we get 1.75%. So, so the, the research that we do is really around the effectiveness of what we've created from a marketing point of, do, point of view. We spent a lot of time figuring out if what we did connected or resonated or what message it left behind. So that's, that's the majority of it. So I just wanted to pick up on something because you had you had talked about your savings and marketing there compared with other people in this space, but you had also begun the conversation by talking about how much more you're paying for these ingredients, these ingredients with integrity, and you had just mentioned a little bit about the uh, whole kind of financial context and the shareholders. So they're they're part of the conversation as well. What do the shareholders think about these increased increased ingredients costs, and how do you communicate that? Well, you know, that's a tricky one because, you know, I mean, if you, I, th I think if you came in and uh, you were uh, really rich and you just bought Chipotle and took it private and took out all those ingredients and went, you know, saved five, six, seven, eight percent on ingredients and started, started buying com commodity stuff, you would have a phenomenally profitable company. We're already the most profitable restaurant brand of, uh, for the most part of this scale. And so for you know, imagine what you could do. And so I, I'm sure there's some shareholders sitting around thinking, God, if we could only get those ingredients out of there, we'd, you know, we'd be rolling in it. But luckily, you know, the brand has become associated with these ingredients. It is what Chipotle stands for. And it's built into the DNA. And the founder is still the CEO and chairman of the board or co-CEO, uh, Steve Ells. And so he keeps it, you know, that, that is going to be part of the company. And so the, you know, the, the good news is that um, we're able to spend more on those ingredients and still be very, very profitable. And, and the way we do it is simple. It's the couple of things I mentioned, which is the really focused menu. So we don't have to spend a bunch of time and money with the scientists and people figuring out the latest, you know, uh, special taco creation is going to be. And we don't have to spend money marketing that. Um, but also we don't have to spend money training crews how to serve it or you know, like re-thermalize it in the restaurant? Because if you're going to have a million different menu items, you can't prepare them like we do. You can't actually cook. You're going to have to take that out. And they're going to have to come pre-prepared, 
pre-cooked or pre-made and then you just reheat them like is what, what happens in most fast food restaurants. So all the cooking would go, would have to go away. Um, so for us, you know, these, this focus menu allows us to do just a few things really, really well. And if you've ever been to a busy Chipotle, serve a lot of people really fast. More, we can serve more than 300 people in an hour at Chipotle, which is vastly more than, than other chains are capable of doing. When you're talking about this re uh, I just wanted to know if you could bring up, you were chatting earlier today about one of the processes to bring a chicken-like product into a uh, Chipotle-like menu item at some places around the country. Uh, just as an insight into uh, some of the uh, uh, twisted path that this follows, do you, do you want to care, yeah, well, care the, to share that process? Sure, you know, I mean, so people often ask me, you know, what do you, you know, those sorts of questions like, what do you, what keeps you up at night? And not a lot, but if, but, <laughs> but, you know, our marketing is based on this idea that our ingredients are better because they are actually better. And, and I think I've maybe shared that. And there's a lot of evidence to support that it's true. And it's obvious when you look at our financials because we're spending more on it. But the risk is anybody can say it. I mean, if you're clever enough with your marketing, you can just say it, right? And that's greenwashing. And people do it all the time. And it's becoming more and more popular. And um, you know, there's, there's big chains that are doing that you know, and trying to simulate Chipotle. And, um, you know, they, their marketing has to be very clever. You know, they, they, do, they, they do television ads where they show, you know, a beautiful kitchen and a, and a chicken breast on a grill with flames and beautiful people and ingredients. And at the bottom it said simulated kitchen, not the real deal. You know, in, and, and then you're like, well, okay, gosh, I, I guess it's not, that's not what's happening. So then you go to their website to figure out, well, what's really happening? And you, you look at it, and it's got, it's got the recipe for their new chicken item, and it's, it sounds delicious. And it's like, well, gosh, that's just seven or eight really great. Oh, it's, it's the inspiration for the recipe, it says in type at the, little, at the bottom of the thing. And you're like, well, OK, well, what's the real recipe? Then you have to click onto the, another website to find the real recipe, which is 40 highly processed ingredients, the primary constituent of which is a combination of chicken breast meat and rib meat, which have been mechanically separated, turn, put in a centrifuge, turned into a slurry, reconstituted into a puck, frozen, uh, par-baked, then painted with stripes that look like grill marks, sent to the restaurant, and then microwaved. And that's, that's, what, it, that's what you got. But what we saw was the beautiful woman in the kitchen with the chicken and the flames. And so it's like, if that's OK, then I guess um, you know, I guess that that's the kind of marketing you want to do, that you got to get comfortable with that. But I think that, you know, consumers are really, really busy. That's one thing we've learned. And they're just, they're not going to take the time to do what I did, um, you know, and figure out what was really going on there. They're just going to buy it at face value. And so that's a really, really big risk for us, you know, that, that other people will, will do this. The, the only hope I have, I guess, is that folks, in the end, you know, of course, it'll, it won't taste that good when you do that. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, but hopefully, you know, people will, will eventually look, you know, into the details enough to really figure out what's going on. You did something unusual in that uh, there was a, a, a big TV spot during the Grammys uh, that caught a lot of people's attention and uh, I think really told a very different story than the one that you're describing uh, just now. Um, for those of you who haven't seen this Grammys TV spot, I think that it got circulated through the uh, new food movement networks and was really viewed as a sign that if Chipotle gets this, then the movement has arrived. Um, what was your consumer response to that? And uh, do you also want to talk a little bit about the origins of that TV spot? Sure. Well, I'll start with the origin of it, which is weird, because um, I, the agency that I had before I went to Chipotle, one of our clients was Chevron, um, which we had trouble sort of dealing with just as an agency. Like, did we want <laughs> Chevron? And so we, we, we took them. Um, and uh, one of the things I was exposed to there was their new ad campaign five or six years ago called Human Energy. You may have seen it. And there was a two and a half minute television spot that they had created, an agency in New York named McGarry Bowen created it. And um, it, would, it just made you cry. Like you watched this thing and you thought, I thought, holy cow. It was like Chevron was going to save the world. And I just wanted to, there were babies. And it was just great. And, <laughs> and I, thought, I watched that. And I thought, and then you know, a few months later, I ended up at Chipotle. And I said, I want one of those. Because if they can do that, imagine if there's a, st a story, you know, like a really compelling story. And so we started making this film. And so that's where that, that came from. And you know, we, we uh, basically told a story, which is a true story, of a farmer of ours um, who, uh, who is a third generation hog farmer and whose father had 
industrialized the farm while he was a kid. You know, it had, it had originally been sort of a typical hog farm. And then his father said, well, we got to, you know, the idea here is you make more money by industrializing. We're going to turn it into a confinement operation. He did that. Uh, the son inherited this thing. And then at some point, um, he got gored by one of the pigs, which is not uncommon on a hog farm, and in his leg, and it got infected. And um, he was infected with an antibiotic resistant strain of, of disease that he had created on that farm, and it almost killed him. Um, you know, with months of time or at least weeks in the hospital and all, every antibiotic known to man, he recovered. And at the end, he decided um, to tear it down. And he uh, exterminated his whole herd and uh, destroyed the, the uh, confinement buildings or whatever and went back to serving uh, uh, naturally raised pork and serves, uh, sells it to Chipotle to this day. Um, so that's where the film came from. Uh, the, the customer response was um, much more than I had anticipated. You know, when we created that thing, uh, we just put it on YouTube, and the next morning there were, the phone calls were coming in, and then we, um, of people that were, were seeing it, and then um, we put it in movie theaters, you know, plays a little bit before the film, those little commercials to play, and um, people were applauding. Like, we had researchers in, in there, and people were applauding for this thing, which is weird. And so, um, so then we decided to put it on the Grammys, you know, which was, which was a bold move, because you don't buy two and a half minutes of time on the Grammys and then do something that doesn't have f sexy shots of the burger flipping or the, you know, the burrito rolling or whatever it is. So it, was, it really shocked people that we would do such a thing. But, um, but it's part of that process I talked about of sort of in, engaging people in this, in this system that they're part of and that there are different ways of doing things. And, you know, it went, went over really well. It, it, not so much with the industrial food guys. They didn't like it much <laughs> at all. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a new film out called Food Patriots. You guys may have seen this or something, but there's a fascinating clip in that film. There's a woman in that film. Her name's Rodora Collins, I think, and she's hired by, I don't know, what's that Farm Bureau, the, some Iowa Farm Bureau or something? Or Missouri Farm Bureau, maybe? And her job is to go around to high schools and teach classes of kids why confinement farming is a good thing. And they actually use that film, Back to the Start, in the classroom. And she goes, let me show you this film you may have seen. And she shows and she goes, let me tell you what's wrong with this. You know? And she basically says why this is all, all ridiculous and why you need to put animals. In fact, she goes, there's no snow in that film, which there's a whole scene where the guy's trudging through the snow. But she says, there's no snow. And that's what, you know, and here in the cold climate, animals don't want to be outside. Strangely, I guess they all want to be inside. So she uses all these strange arguments, you know, and it's fascinating. There's, there's actually people who are paid to go out and discredit stuff like that because the, the, the thing that the industrial food uh, industry wants to happen, the very, very least, the thing they're most afraid of is a swell of public opinion. Look what happened to pink slime. Talk about changing an industry in a couple of months. Like if, 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 if consumers all of a sudden get upset about some particular tactic or something, that's big, big trouble um, for these guys. So they really don't like films and marketing like that that actually gets people you know, emotionally involved. Has Chipotle heard from any of these groups directly oh, uh, sure, regarding yeah. this marketing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The guy, the, Missouri, the head of the Missouri Farm Bureau, a guy named Blake Hurst, wrote an op-ed piece uh, that was published in the New York Times, which I, I don't remember exactly what it said, but it was basically, here's why this is a load of crap. And you know, we, you know, we get all sorts of you know, interaction with our customer service team and on our Facebook page. You know, we had sort of people trying to take over our Facebook page, sort of, you know, and they're trying to paint us as anti-farmer, you know, because farmers obviously run even industrial farms. It doesn't, it's not really always a matter of scale. It's like there are family farms doing confinement stuff. So family farms isn't the distinction. It's it's just there's different ways of doing stuff, and we have a belief that there's a certain way that we think is better. That's kind of what it comes down to. I wanted to provide an opportunity for uh, the questions from the audience that I'm sure you've got, but I just wanted to finish with one thing because um, it's a clarification because of a question that I got from a student just yesterday. Uh, it's about the McDonald's thing again. Um, so the question that I got from the student is, uh, isn't it true that McDonald's is the owner of Chipotle? Uh, <laughs> could you uh, fill in the backstory there? Uh, no, they're not, they're not the owner, you know, but there's a bit of history or truth to the urban legend, which is, you know, they were a, an investor. In fact, they were the majority investor. Um, when Steve had, I don't know, a 
dozen, 20 restaurants or something like that. He was looking for an investor and he um, went to McDonald's and they helped fund the growth from, you know, to a few hundred restaurants and, and actually divested all of their interest when the company went public and never had any control, or, well, they had control, but they never had much influence or any influence over the company. Um, never changed any of the leadership, never changed any of the processes and stuff. So um, it was benign, but it lives on as sort of the, as the marketing guy's worst nightmare. Really, <laughs> you know, it's like, so spread the word. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to uh, turn it over to questions. So just by hands, uh, I'll start, start taking them. Uh, you guys. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, oh yeah, is there a mic traveling? Okay. Hi, I'm Justin. I'm a third year joint degree with the School of Management and the School of Forestry. And um, I'm curious, given Chipotle's rapid growth, um, how you balance the need to continue growing with the fact that the bigger you grow, the harder it's going to be to continue to source the quantity of particularly animal products at the standards that you want. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. You know, I mean, the, the, um, the good news is that in some cases, like the Nyman Ranch example that I used, we, there's a big incentive for farmers to join into the network to supply companies like Chipotle. The, the problem that we, we run into is where we, where we don't use the entire animal. And, and with pork, it's easy for us to, to, to sell the rest, or for, the, for Nyman to sell the rest of the animal that we don't use. With chicken, it's harder. Um, you know, and so uh, right now we still have a complete supply of, of chicken raised without antibiotics, but I told you that's still not even what we would like to see happen. Um, beef is the biggest challenge for us. We buy all the naturally raised beef we can in this country, and sometimes we run short. And we, we have markets that, where we have to go back to conventional beef. And so um, it is a, it's an ongoing concern, but our, our, our belief is that our demand for the higher margin product for the product where we're going to pay a premium is stronger than than any other force in terms of getting change to happen. The economic incentive is the strongest force we probably have. And so we want to keep the demand there. We're always willing to buy it. So we wouldn't ever let it limit our growth. And we hope that it would actually incent farmers to to supply us meeting our protocols. Uh, in, in, in the black and then pink. Hi, um, my name is Christopher. Um, you said before that the more specific you got with your major advertisements, like your billboards and stuff, the less effective it was. But how do you find that the more specific you got once you're in store? Like, I remember the cups used to have these cute little stories on them about like the better farms and how, how effective they were. Did you find that being so specific once the customer was already in the store was actually sort of like against your marketing? Yeah, exactly. So I mean, the, the closer somebody gets to the brand, the more specific you can be. And so we, um, you know, it's on a billboard, it's the least specific you can possibly be probably. And so those, those have to be very general messages. But once somebody's actually become a customer, then you can get more specific. And once somebody's a loyal customer, you can be even more specific. We, th we hold these food and music events called Cultivate Festivals around the country. And we're going to have three this year, one in Chicago, one in San Francisco, one in Denver. The one in Chicago last year was 30,000 people showed up. And it's, they're totally fun, you know, it's music and chefs and stuff, but we have these, this Chipotle experience that you go through and you get a little passport stamped if you go to these Chipotle things and you get a free burrito, which is a, you know, which means I think 17,000 people did it in Chicago. But one of the things we had was a, a gestation crate you know, which was one, you know, guys, you all know what that is, you know, where these hogs, female hogs spend their lives in these torture chambers. And we had them, um, and people could crawl in them and stuff like that. And so we, that's very specific stuff, you know, but at that point, we've got them, they're engaged, they love Chipotle, they're having a good time, they got a beer, they got a burrito, and they, you know, like, hey, this sucks, you know, and they're like, yeah, it really does. And people are really engaged with it. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a matter of when you do it. And, but, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the closer they get to the brand, the more specific you can be. But at the high level, you the messages are lost. Right next. Um, what are the companies that you think are doing better than you in some areas, and like, how are you gonna how are you gonna respond to that? Well, um, 
That's a good question. I've never really thought about that, you know, because I, I don't spend a lot of time focused on, on the competition. But I, one thing I can say with pretty, with confidence is that I don't think anybody's doing better than we are at our scale. Um, the size of Chipotle and the, the amount that we're buying of these things is phenomenal. And it, 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 the way we're growing, we grow so fast that it's growing, you know, each year. The fact that we're able to do this stuff is amazing. So I don't think there's a company of our size that's doing better. There are, there are certainly companies at a smaller scale that are able to do things that, that I am envious of. For example, like serve uh, grass-fed beef, which is very difficult for us. And we're going to get there, I think, but it's, it's very difficult in this country um, to do that. And, you know, so I, I basically applaud anybody that can do anything better than we are. And, and in the end, if you look at it from my perspective, our marketing is, you know, if, if other people do exactly what we do and actually do it rather than lie about it, if they actually do it, then that's a win, right? But it ultimately means that we're not as differentiated. So for us, success means Chipotle blends in with everybody else. So I kind of hope that happens. I mean, I do hope that happens. I do believe, though, by that time, we'll already be on to the next thing. We'll be pushing the, the boundary at the, because there's no final destination in what we're doing here. I'll take a couple more, and I should also let you know that there's going to be a, uh, a super special surprise after we've done the last question. Um, yes. <clears throat> I'm curious about what you were saying um, with respect to your employees and how you see them and the behavior change that, that they're taking on as an indicator of your success um, with a lot of your sustainable initiatives. And I'm wondering if you have any uh, educational practices or policies. How do your employees pick up the information about your food and its quality? And um, I, I don't know if there are any lessons learned there. Well, the biggest lesson learned there is it's really hard to keep 35,000 employees informed at a meaningful level when, you know, you've got a uh, turnover of, you know, around 100% where so, you know, a lot of those employees will leave and then be replaced within a year. It's very typical. It's actually low in the restaurant business, really low. Um, you know, but uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge. And there's, there's some misinformation in our restaurants. You know, if you ask an employee, well, tell me a little bit about the ingredients. Oftentimes it's not, right? Um, and uh, they do the best they can. But so, so we have a team, on, our, on my marketing team, we have uh, 32 people that are called marketing strategists, and they're spread out all around the country. And one of their jobs is to teach uh, not only marketing, but the basics of food with integrity and what we do to our field teams, to the field leadership, and then to the restaurant crews. And they hold marketing meetings. They attend what they call their patch meetings, which are the groups of restaurants that form a patch, a marketing patch. And they, uh, they basically teach them. So we do it by hand, basically. We go down and we, we meet with people and we, we tell them. And, and then a lot of it's spread by word of mouth from one employee to the other, which is where you get some of the misinformation. It's the game of telephone. And before long, all of our ingredients are organic when only some of them are. You know? So that sort of stuff does happen. Anyone over on the south side of the room? I've had my back key for most. Peter? Uh, my name is Peter Platt. I'm second year of School of Management. Um, and a question about the uh, Latino demographic. I know you're mentioning that your own sort of demographic analysis wasn't necessarily um, that fruitful in, in, in messaging, but I'm wondering how the rising Latino demographic itself as a category, particularly in the Southwest, might present some opportunities to, for menu innovation and for in new ingredient sourcing to drive maybe some of the demand towards grass-fed. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've, in the early years of Chipotle, we didn't have much success, actually, when we put restaurants in Latino communities, um, which I, I guess isn't a surprise. But of late, um, we've done a lot of, we put a lot of restaurants in Southern California and in Los Angeles and, and in Latino communities have, and have done really well. And, you know, a lot of the employees at Chipotle are Latino, of course. And so there's a big Latino influence in the company. You know, in terms of... Um, sourcing, you know, we, we do have a new focus on, on Mexico and some of the ingredients that we're getting there and some of the peppers that we want to get from Mexico and trying to actually reinvigorate a dying type of pepper that we'd like to see there. Um, and so there's, there's definitely been an ongoing influence in the company, you know, with regard to new products. I mean, we don't really add them. You know, we, we are, you know, in terms of doing stuff, new stuff, you know, we do have a 
it's, it's got nothing to do with the Latino community, but I'll use it to say that um, we do, you know, we have another brand that we've created. It's called Shop, Shop House, Southeast Asian Kitchen. There's only one right now in Washington, D.C., soon to be one in L.A. Um, and it's basically the Asian version of Chipotle. And it's, it's all the same ingredients in terms of their the, being responsibly raised. And um, you go down the line and you choose from all these different things, and it's, it's really delicious. It's, so, you know, there's, there's ongoing influences in the company that may actually lead to other concepts. Hi, I'm Darcy Scheiber Knowles, also a second year MBA. Um, if I've heard many people say that if we're actually going to have an impact on the sustainability of our food system, we've really got to take a look at meat and meat consumption and um, the quantity that we put on our plates. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear the conversations that are happening at Chipotle and the inherent tension um, of being a kind of meat forward, meat centric, albeit sustainable fast food company. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do have that conversation all the time because we're all of the the senior folks at Chipotle, I think it's safe to say, are meat reducers. I mean, I don't think any of us are vegetarians, but we, we think of a meat as a side portion in our, in our meals, and it's not, we, we don't, we, we always share, if we ever go to a restaurant, we always are sharing the, the meat portion, splitting it. Um, so it's something that's in our thinking, and um, to that end, for a couple of years, we've been working on figuring out a, a, a new vegetarian option, and so we, we spent a couple of years doing this. We, we had something called Garden Blend for a while, which is kind of a soy. Um, it's, it's one of those products that's sort of trying to imitate meat, which, which I, don't, I don't like very much. And Steve, the, the founder and the chef, doesn't like at all this idea of sort of imitating meat. And so, so we just created or just finished creating a new product called Sofritas, which you may have heard about um, if you watch any of this stuff, which is an organic tofu which um, is puffed, um, which is a nice way of saying fried. But when you fry tofu, it doesn't really absorb the oil because there's a lot of water in it. So it's just, it basically kind of puffs it up. Then we mix it in with a sofrito and it, it basically absorbs this delicious uh, chipotle sofrito flavor. And um, we launched it in seven Bay Area restaurants a few weeks ago, which admittedly was a soft target. But, um, <laughs> But it's, it's gone really, really well, and um, you know, we're selling a lot of it, many, much, much more of it than we would to just vegetarians and vegans, which is my objective with the marketing of it, that it's only going to be a success if we sell it, if we get people to trade off of meats. And we're seeing that. We're seeing first they're trading from chicken, and then second from steak, and then third from pork into this product at, at a much higher rate than we, when we would expect if it was just vegetarians and vegans. So um, we're going to now roll it out to all of Northern California, and I, I suspect from the way it's going, it, it looks like it's got a good shot of actually being the thing that we add to the menu. So I think that's a pretty major statement to say that if you're going to put something new on the menu, the thing it's going to be is, a, is, is tofu. That's not what the other guys would do, I don't think. So thank, should we, should yeah, we set up this, this other you thing? Very, yeah, sure. you bet. thank you very much. And, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, for the video, I just wanted to uh, conclude the formal. Yeah, go ahead. Applause is, <laughs> applause is nice. <laughs> so let's actually uh, conclude the recording. And yeah. uh, Mark, do you want to tell us about sure. what we're Sure. So this seeing? is for your eyes only. This is my 